Hi, I'm Tom Patterson with Flying, and today we're talking with Phil Straub, Executive Vice President and Managing Director of Aviation at Garmin. Thank you, and it's great to meet you, Phil, uh, and to have the opportunity to get the latest about Garmin uh, Avionics. But first, I want to hear a little bit about your story. I know you started flying at age 16. You worked at as, as a CFI during college. How did your journey lead you to Garmin? Well, uh, the background there, I always say my dad was an inspiration for me. He was an engineer, an electrical engineer, and also a private pilot. So I grew up with those influences where he was kind of techie, always fixing stuff, and he was also flying his little Cessna 150. So it was probably that influence that drove me to pursue flying as well as a technical path in my education. And uh, I ended up flying here, not even using his, his airplane. Uh, we actually kept it a couple hours away on a family farm. And I was an impatient teenager and decided, you know, I just had to start flying before he was ready for me. And so I snuck off and did that. And saw so and then said, hey, Dad, got something to tell you. But he was supportive, and I kept going with it. And by the time college came around, I was probably pretty sure I wanted to do a technical degree. So I ended up doing electrical engineering, surprise. And when I graduated from college, that was a fork in the road, and it was really a tough decision because I love flying, and I always will. But at that point, I also had that desire to create stuff that was just fun, and it ultimately led me to Garmin, who was a small startup uh, company in Lenexa, which is uh, a suburb of Kansas City, and that was July of 1993, and gosh, almost 30 years have passed now, so a lot of history since then, but it's just been a great fit of the love of aviation and making flying safer, better, more accessible, along with creating stuff. It really is remarkable to think about how Garmin technology has changed general aviation with its glass cockpit technology, um, the kind of technology that supports the pilot without taking them out of the loop. I know you were involved in developing the GNS 430 and the GNS 530, as well as the G1000. What do you remember about developing those important products? Uh, a lot of hard work, uh, but those are probably some, I mean, there's uh, so many highlights of your career, but at that point in my career, I'd been at Garmin, you know, say three, three years or so, and, and started to work on the GNS 430. And I was an individual contributor, an engineer, so, you know, you're in the, the depths of product development, and I was wearing a lot of hats in a small company, so I got to do user interface design. So every page, I, you know, I laid out on the 430 based upon the flying experience I had at that point, which is probably two to 3,000 hours of flight time and some, a bunch of flight instruction in there as well. But then I also got to work on my passion of like the low level software. So I was doing assembly code, the instrument landing system, the localizer, the glide slope, the VOR, and then we do some page development. But the other cool part is then I go out and fly it, right? And so I really love that to go out and fly it and then work with the FAA in a collaborative manner and then eventually go into the flight test side of things. All the while, I'm still like teaching because I, I love to teach. And so I was teaching in the evenings, I was teaching on the weekends, and I was trying to keep this great secret of this GNS 430 quiet you know from all my buddies that love to fly as well and i know i'm up to something but i couldn't tell them so when we could finally come out with it it was a great great experience and that product went on to you know deliver i think between it and the 530 that is a family over 125,000 units so great experience and yes also about 530 and, and g1000 and those just kind of were a follow-on type thing right and, uh, you know, 530 and I growth of a 430, and then the G1000 was bringing more collective pieces together, but all based upon enabling flat panel displays, you know, the MEMS technology that allows uh, low-cost solid-state attitude heading reference systems. Those pieces coming together that just opened up glass cockpits for the lighter end of general ABs. I also wanted to offer my congratulations to you and everyone at Garmin for winning the Collier Trophy for Autoland. And, and what an amazing piece of technology that has come to be known for. Is there um, a story that you could share with us surrounding the creation of, of this really innovative technology? Well, thank you, and it never gets old. I mean, gosh, we're just humbled to be part of these icons in aviation that have been recognized by the highest prestige in aviation and aerospace. So. You know, I wish I had, like, a great, like, story. People said, was there an aha moment when you said, oh, we ought to do this? 
And I really say it was more evolutionary, kind of like I talked about with our product line, right? And for me, kind of the, the anchor was, uh, if I go back in history, I was working on the GNS 530 at the time. And that's when the unfortunate, sad, tragic Payne Stewart accident occurred. And it was, uh, I think, October, if I remember right, of uh, 1999. And so that stuck in our heads, you know, and, and we saw that. We were, everyone was riveted to it. And I think as engineers and as pilots, we were thinking, could that have happened to us? Would we have, you know, uh, dealt with that situation any differently? And so that was that little marker in the back of your mind. But as things came along with the, I talked about pilots, you know, we aviate, we navigate, and we communicate. So AVA will navigate, for example, that's our GPS technology, among other things as well. Uh, AVA, the flight controls computers, and you know, we've developed the digital solid state autopilot, it's very capable, and communicate is a lot of different things. You know, we think about the voice communications, also satellite communications, but we also develop the ability for speech recognition, as well as synthesizing your voice, so text to speech. So lo and behold, let's say about 10 years later, a little more in 2011, kind of all these technology pieces had matured to enough point. We said, you know, we can really do this, and there shouldn't be another sad, tragic accident like that ever occur again. So that's when we started working on it and said, let's uh, let's make this happen. That's fantastic. So I'm sure there must be one or two people in the world who don't know what Autoland is and how it works. <laughs> um, so for those people in our audience, could you explain what it is and exactly how it works? What makes it so innovative? Yeah, well, Autoland is designed to safely take an airplane from really anywhere, let's say the in structure, but it could be anywhere, back down to the surface of the runway in a safe manner. And it does it all autonomously without pilot or crew interaction. And I'm always quick to point out and say, you know, we're not the first that have landed an airplane autonomously because the airlines have Category 3 auto land all the time. But that still involves pilot and crew interaction with the system to make that happen. So this system's designed to recognize, first of all, is there a possibility that the pilot or crew may no longer be doing the function? So it'll see depressurization type events. It'll look for interactions of the crew or the pilot with the system goes long enough and starts asking, are you still there? Are you still doing your thing? Or it can be activated by either the pilot or the passengers with a button. So if that happens, uh, the system then starts, it, it identifies the most suitable place for landing. It then begins to communicate to air traffic control all autonomously, hey, we're going to go to this airport, we're in a distress situation, and then it navigates that way with the automation, the, the flight control system, flying the aircraft all the way to safe touchdown and landing and full stop. And then I think the really cool part is we said, you know, if we're really going to be focused on safety, if this airplane, especially if it has a propeller on it, we can't leave that engine running when, when it's on the ground and these passengers are getting out of the airplane. So we even shut down the engine once the aircraft is safely on a stop, at a stop on the ground. That is absolutely amazing. Again, congratulations. So what new products have been inspired by Autoland? What is next in this sort of area for Garmin? Well, I would say we focus so much on the pilot and the crew, trying to put safety nets around them and help them do their job, you know. But Autoland, we have the, our, our head of engineering came up with this catchy little thing. He said, you know, Autoland is about a uh, bad pilot, good airplane. And I don't mean bad, but I mean, the pilot is not there to do their job for whatever reason, cardiac, medical, who knows, you know, hypoxia. But the airplane is a perfectly functioning airplane. We have another system called Smart Glide that is just the opposite. We call it uh, good pilot, bad airplane, just in a simplified sense. But Smart Glide is about helping a fully capable crew and pilot uh, with an airplane that may not, may be having power plant issues, may be full power plant failure, maybe partial power plant failure, but helping that crew get to a safe place to land. And when you think about it, you know, as a, especially as an instructor, when I do simulated engine failures, there's always that surprise element. And there's so many little steps you have to do at the time. So what we do is we use our automation to help them with the aviate, the navigate, and the communicate. So we use the autopilot to help them fly at best glide airspeed. 
we're using navigation systems to pick the most suitable airport. May not be the closest, but the most suitable airport and establish a course there. And then on the communicate side, we'll offer to the pilot, here's the emergency frequency, do you want to activate it? And the emergency squawk code for the transponder so that everyone can see what's going on. So it's just a huge workload reliever and helps a pilot focus on what they need to do, which is identify the problem and fix it if they can, and if not, then get safer to that airport. Outstanding. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. That's pretty much all the time we have, Phil. But I just want to thank you, Phil Straub of Garmin, and thank you for watching. I'm Tom Patterson with Flying. Thank you, Tom.